I think before we even get into this interview, I should just ask a very basic question, which is, is there something you want to share before we even begin? Some observation. Yes, I, I think it would be careless not to, uh, not to take the opportunity to do that. Uh, I guess life, you know, is, uh, is a big bowl, and sometimes you can reach in that bowl and get pretty much whatever you want out of it if you work hard enough for it. Um, I never had a, a lightning strike idea. It was never anything like that. It's always been kind of subtle, subtle and somewhat slow coming on. But once I am engaged, it's uh, it's uh, full speed ahead. And uh, so much of the things that I've been involved in have been because of the wonderful people that I've had to associate with me in my life. Back from my early childhood up to, to date, uh, I have been blessed to be able to uh, connect with people that were brilliant, they were honest, they were helpful, and they were good counselors for me that enabled me to move forward. Let's call them a village of people that, uh, that had the tools and the equipment to work with and uh, was uh, extremely helpful in guiding me. But I must tell you this story, and I, I'll tell you now because I just celebrated my 90th birthday, March 30th of this year, which I'm very happy to, to brag about. And uh, I began to think about a lot of the things that uh, some of us had been involved in that that have been so important, just not to Corbett County, just not to Southern Maryland, but really some things have had a, a very definite state and a national focus and even an international focus in some instances. Um, I just, I have to tell this story because I think, uh, you know, some of this may be irrelevant to a lot of people. But I, I think there's some historical aspects that need to be preserved in posterity mm -hmm. forever and always. And uh, there's no better time than right now to do that. Uh, I've been blessed to have the coherency that I've always prayed for. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I'm to, if I'm to live to be an old age, uh, I hope that the uh, the mental department will work in concert with the physical department. And thus far, it has been a magnificent journey for me. And for that, I'm very grateful. But I, I must tell you this, without sounding too sanctimonious, it all didn't begin recently. It, it happened at the tender age of 14. I well remember I was a sophomore in high school. We had no uh, middle or junior schools in those, junior high schools in those days. Uh, so you only went to 11 grades. And I started school when I was five, graduated at the age of 16. Um, during that period of, in high school, at the age of 14 in 1938, I went to my home church and they had a revival meeting, which was, was very common. Every year they had a revival meeting. They brought in visiting evangelists and uh, people very artful. They were singers, they made music and all. And uh, that was uh, without television and radio and all the other attractions you have today. That was a very natural thing for people to congregate at those revivals and I attended one. And uh, one evening during that period of time, the sermon that the evangelist, whose name was Reverend P.F. Elliot, uh, preached that night. It was very touching. 
was very revealing and it was an opportunity for me to really connect with uh, the spiritual side of my life. And I did so. I, I uh, knelt at the altar that night and asked God to be my, my, uh, my compass. Uh, I, want to, I want to do what's right in this life. And uh, I want to, uh, I don't want to be a king or a president. I just want to do things that are good in general for mankind, and those things will be pleasing to you. Forgive my past and forgive the things that will happen in the future that I'll never be too proud of. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there, there are temptations, and we all, we're all, in a way, I guess, let's say, are sinners. Uh, we make mistakes at time unconsciously. But I really believe the commitment that I made that night in 1938, that's been a long time ago, has served as a rule and guide of my faith. It's been my, uh, my directors, my direction. It's been my beacon. It's been my benchmark. And uh, though I've strayed from time to time to the left or right, I never lost sight of the fact that uh, there is a creator of this magnificent universe and uh, he has a job for me to do and if I'm going to do that job right I can only do it with his help and so having said that I guess that is the uh, the beginnings of whatever accomplishments I've been fortunate enough to make with the village of folks that I've worked with over the years. It's been a real, real wonderful experience. A journey, quite frankly, that took me a long ways to Washington, D.C. The first time I ever went to Washington, D.C., I went there at the age of 16 to live and to go to school. And not too long after that, I was uh, fortunate enough to be one or three brothers that served in World War II. And uh, I lost my oldest brother in, uh, in the European theater of war. The other two of us uh, were un unharmed. Uh, some experiences I wouldn't want to go through again, but I wouldn't take the world for the fact. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't trade that experience and that time in my life for anything I know of because uh, this, is the, this is the greatest nation in the world. Uh, no question about it. And it was worth fighting for. It's uh, disconcerting that we fight wars and we find out in the final analysis that wars really don't accomplish a great deal. It does in a tentative sense, but it, it doesn't for the long haul. How many wars have we had since World War II? And it goes on and on and on. But let's get down to the, to the objective or the goals that we have for this program that we're, we're going to try to put together today and days that follow. We know that uh, we know that you have a starting point in life, and uh, I was no different than anyone else. I uh, spent a lot of my young life in uh, a business at Brooms Island, the the place that I grew up with, and grew up on, and worked and played and enjoyed every moment of it. The lifestyle was so different then; the culture was so different then. You, you didn't have any fear for any of the ugliness that's happening in this country of ours now. We're good and we'll always be good because I think we've, God has blessed us because I think he knows there's enough righteous people in this country that want to do right, that uh, we've been able to be victorious and we'll, continue to be the world leader. But uh, there's an opportunity for us to, to really make a change. We have got to work towards uh, a more cooperative uh, 
situation. We've got to understand that uh, fighting is not the answer. It's, uh, it's a matter of trying to coexist with people in a peaceful atmosphere. And that would, uh, that would suffice all that we ever need if that could occur. Let me ask you some questions yeah. about Give me go your, because your, mor your moral compass. So Matt Mathias, he began to see that the watermen were having trouble. They were talking about dirty water. So he decided to do a boat trip all around the Chesapeake Bay. And different people joined that boat trip. That's when you joined the boat trip? Yes. So you floated with the congressmen and others. Tell me about that. Tell me about what happened, because that event really kicked off the whole EPA Chesapeake Bay study. He chaired that, he chaired that committee, and it was the first huge study of its kind. So what happened on that boat? Well, I think even, even before the boat, our court suit was kind of out in front. He knew, he knew that we were already uh, going to court. We had hired environmental attorneys. We were waiting for them to come up with, uh, you know, a procedure that made sense. And where did you get the money for the attorneys? The money came from the taxpaying public in Culver Charles in St. Mary's wow. County. We didn't seek any grant. Okay. It's our river. And he it's, heard about this. And he heard about that, and he heeded that. And out of that, his, when I was talking with him that day, he lit up, and he was just a wonderful man to talk with, and a, a mover and shaker. And uh, this was not a political move for him. I think it was coming from his heart. He was like me. He had an affection for this great resource, and he wanted to see something done about it. And he went to the top and uh, recommended and ultimately got legislation that approved a $29 million study right. of the entire Chesapeake Bay to find out what was wrong. And we don't have to repeat all of that. We suspected then what was wrong because of the scientists at Chesapeake Biological Lab. They were saying it's over enrichment of nitrogen and phosphorus and too much sedimentation and toxicity going into the river. It's foreign to the river, it can't handle it. We need to change that. His study was unquestionably one of the chains, uh, one of the links in the chains that helped to bring things together and get and, us in focus. And his study uh, really served as a catalyst to get a lot of the academic institutions, a lot of the labs talking to one another. Were you aware of like VIMS and you know, Penn State and all of these different academic institutions all focused on Chesapeake Bay? I had, uh, I had very little knowledge of the, uh, all the different components out there in the organization. So this is really but this, this uh, action, uh, because of the attention is being focused now yeah. on the severity of the problem, it was becoming dramatized and uh, it began to different organization focus. All of a sudden, here comes the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, for instance, and they interviewed me. Well, what do you think about this court suit? And I told them, I said, I think it's the only hope we have. And what year was that? That was uh, started in 1973. We finally went in court. I think in, I believe it was 76. I'd have to look at my so notes to find it. You've got a timeline of the court in the early 70s. Then 1976, 77, you've got the, the uh, EPA Bay Program study commencing. Yes. That study is going to then deliver its findings and recommendations in 1983. When did you run for Senate? I ran for Senate in 1982 and was sworn in office in January of 1983 and was able to attend the conference. first conference they had at George Mason University. And, uh, and describe that scene. Oh, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, uh, I was shocked because the Chesapeake Bay Foundation had put together a film of Brooms Island and Reedville, Virginia. 
and the contrast because Reedville was still pretty wholesome then and the area around Brooms Island and Patuxent River was kind of suffocating because of the uh, earlier meant things that I mentioned, the nitrogen, phosphorus, over and uh, induction of that. Mm -hmm. But so they, they, at the conference, so oh. they showed this film. They showed, they showed the film, it was called yeah. The Chesapeake Horizon, and it showed it, and I liked to flip out of my seat when they showed it. It's on this you huge screen. Saw yes. And uh, we had a number, we had Marilyn Reeves and we had a lady from Reedville, Virginia, and they were all super good. And it really today, in fact, it won uh, a big award for the best uh, comment, uh, commentary uh, on the environment for that year. Uh, so now there is a big conference underway. And there were dozens and dozens of legislators at that conference. I remember there was almost a thousand people. Now you went back to the General Assembly. Did you know when you ran for office that you would be such a strong environmental advocate? Or did you grow into that? H how did that happen, that you became such an environmental legislator? Well, growing up as a child on Brooms Island, I, I watched a river that was so gracious and so good to us. And I watched the demise of that river. And, uh, you know, you, you have that, that river water in your blood. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. And you don't want to see something that has provided people with the substance that they needed in life at a time during the Great Depression when that's about all you had to eat was what you raised and what you could get out of the water. And that, that Patuxent River was more than gracious to us. So it, when, you, when you see something that important and such an in, integral part of our, even our human health, uh, to see that begin to leave and slip away, you want to do something about it. That was one of the major reasons that I ran for county commissioners because of the demise of the river. And secondly, I ran for county commissioner because I was tired of seeing closed government. I wanted open government up. I called it tabletop government. And the, uh, uh, the third thing was that we had an educational system. The poorest subdivision in the state of Maryland, we had an educational system that was equal to that. And I wanted better than that. And we had an opportunity to do that because we had, uh, we had the Baltimore Gas Electric Company was coming on, which was going to provide some funds. So it, 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 all, came from, it all came from drive from my, my, my heart, the, the love I had for the river and the hope and the expectations that we could get that river cleaned up in a hurry if we did the right kind of things. Uh, that's really where the drive came from. So when I went to Annapolis as a uh, bona fide senator, and I was so grateful to be there, you know, it was, it, yeah. was, it was a wonderful experience. And we had some great people up there, great leaders up there. We had, uh, we had uh, Cheryl Weingrad, Senator Weingrad. We had uh, Mrs. Garrett. I mean, uh, these people, when they told you something, they were playing games. And they had an affection also for the environment, not just the Patuxent River, but the bay, the air, all there was to make life pleasant, more pleasant for people. And so we, uh, that, that is what really caused us to dig our heels in. And from that moment on, I guess there's always been the uh, nurturing I've had from the divine intervention that I spoke of earlier. That, that keeps my mood running. Okay, so now you are a new legislator, and your first term is going to be 1984, which is right when they signed the Chesapeake Bay Agreement, and now you've got to get to work and work on legislation. That's also the year you were asked or be appointed to the Chesapeake Bay Commission. How did that happen? Um. We had been talking the environment ever since I got up there, and there was a group of us that met each year, a small group of us, met with the president of the Senate, President Mike Miller, 
and uh, he was always very receptive to our thoughts. And we would, things that we wanted to do legislatively, we would run by him, uh, hoping to garner up his support. And for the most part, the big stuff, he was always on board with us to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, environmental education, uh, uh, the uh, phosphorus ban, the critical areas, the uh, rockfish moratorium, you know, the list grows on and on and on. And uh, let's not leave one very important person out of this. And uh, I speak from the heart now. It was Governor Harry Hughes, who was never considered to be an environmentalist. In fact, it's in a national magazine. I have a copy of it where John Griffin uh, was being interviewed, and he said, Harry Hughes was never an environmentalist until Bernie Fowler got a hold of him. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, Governor Harry Hughes was one of the greatest friends I ever had and one of the strongest supporters I ever had. Had it not been for the Constitution restricting him serving another four years or eight years, we would have had that Patuxent River glistening by now. But when he left, the program got shortchanged. But uh, that, 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 that's what we did every year. We got together with the President of the Senate, went over the things that we thought were important, and uh, for the most part, we got some big stuff through there. Because of the people that I mentioned earlier, you had the, you had the wine grad, you had uh, Mrs. Garrett, uh, some of the mines, uh, some of the names slip of mine right now. But uh, Arthur Dorman, mm -hmm. super guy, he's the one actually legislated right. the Patuxent River Commission. Mm -hmm. So. Um, tell me about the commission. So what was it like when you were finally, now you're appointed to this interstate Chesapeake Bay Commission, a new senator, you're going to be serving with House and Senate members. Um, when you were first appointed to the commission in 84, Pennsylvania wasn't even a member yet of the commission. They came in on 85. What's your recall of the early years? Well, the early years were very interesting years because this was a, a time of formation, a time of learning, and uh, we had some uh, we had some strong individuals on that, and they were uh, they were not playing games. They were dead serious about doing something to help clean up this Chesapeake Bay, and what better organization or what better form or platform could you have than the Chesapeake Bay Commission? when you have uh, 15 elected officials on board and citizens representative and uh, staff to support you and plenty of advisors through the uh, regulatory agencies and all. And the, uh, it was an exciting time for me, quite frankly, because I saw a real opportunity here to, uh, to move forward on some projects that would make a difference in uh, bringing some life back to the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, while uh, we have some disappointments, obviously, because we aren't there yet, I don't know why I had a uh, vision that we would have the, the Patuxent River cleaned up in 10 or 15 years, and the bay would only take another 15 years. That hasn't happened. Uh, but because of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, their tenacity, the determination, and we have been fortunate to have a great staff working and leading that organization that has caused us to bond together in a tri-state manner. At first it was bi-state, just Virginia and Maryland, now it becomes tri-state. And as we speak now, we've got all six of the states in the District of Columbia that have a voice in the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Uh, the plan that they have on board is, uh, is a good plan. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't meet all of the, the things I'd like to see. And if you become complacent and too happy, you don't gain anything. You've always got to be reaching for the moon. And if you miss the moon, you're right up there with the stars anyway. So, uh, but the, the Chesapeake Bay Commission has been a very important part of my life. Talk to me about this. Periodically through my time with you, I have seen where you disagreed 
with other people. You disagreed with other House and Senate members who you actually had a very decent rapport with. Um, I'm thinking about things like Site 104, where they wanted to put the dredge material in the heart of Chesapeake Bay. Or um, over the years where we were setting limits for sewage treatment plants or things like that, where you said, no, we need to go further. Where do you get the courage to buck these other people who don't want to go as far? It has to begin with uh, a conviction that it is the right thing to do. That is number one. It has got to be the right thing to do, in this case for the Chesapeake Bay and the people who live around it. And once you, uh, once you are convinced of that, uh, then there's no turning back. You, the courage is there because you know you're right in what you're doing. And losing a battle once in a while doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose the war. But you, you can't afford to compromise too greatly. Mm -hmm. The democracy as a whole is the art of compromise, and we recognize that. But you can't compromise those things that you know are going to lead you in the wrong direction. So it's been for that reason that I have always been able to muster up the courage that I needed in a very forceful way to uh, be sure that the, that the ship stayed on course, that box the compass and keep the ship on course. And uh, that's what we tried very hard to do. And I think in some instances it's, it's paid off. The, uh, the dredging of the spoils in the Baltimore Harbor I think would have, would have been a catastrophe that we would have been a long time overcoming had we gone ahead with the plan to dump all of those spoils in the deep trough of the channel of the Chesapeake Bay. There's a lot of movement down there with current and all, and uh, that movement would have certainly scattered that stuff all over the bay. I don't think anyone could predict in the wildest imagination the damage that could have done had that occurred. So regardless of the fact that you had lots of legislative colleagues and governors and others supporting that Site 104, it was just the fact that you knew it was right that just kept you going. Exactly right. Uh, you, you know that uh, that was the wrong thing to do. Dumb that spoils was wrong. And that uh, for that reason, there's just no room to compromise. And you do everything you possibly can within uh, within reason yeah. to convince. And if you can't convince, then you have to stand like the rock of Gibraltar. You just can't budge. You have got to fight it until you either lose the battle or the battle is won. And it, when you win like that, it's always a win for the Chesapeake Bay, which happens to be, in my judgment, one of the greatest estuaries in this whole world. No doubt about that. <laughs> so when, when uh, talk to me about this. You were talking about wins, and I can't help but look at you and think about Program Open Space. Program Open Space is, is revered nationwide as an outstanding land conservation program. But over the years, uh, you know, I saw time and time again where they tried to raid the dedicated funds of Program Open Space. And you were always there questioning that authority, questioning that judgment. Tell us about Program Open Space and, and at least how you think it should have functioned and how, what you did for it. Program Open Space was a, was a very, very important piece of legislation. The intent of that legislation, and in fact the, the, the guts of that in the legislation, was simply one half of one percent uh, of the uh, fee was that. Right, of the, of the um, transfer tax. Transfer tax. Uh, one half of one percent of the transfer tax was to go into a dedicated fund, and that fund was to be used to purchase open space, and also it could be used to enhance the purchases of those uh, the, the open space that you'd purchased. Uh, I think just about every governor during my uh, service raided that fund, and uh, it was a wrong thing to do. 
this legislation was passed with the hope of providing the much needed forested land and recreational areas we need uh, for generations that follow us. And to see this rated and to slow that program down was uh, somewhat hypocritical. Uh, sure, there are times when the budget constraints forces you to do some things you don't necessarily want to do, but that was bad judgment in using that to do that. The and program open space was designed to keep pace with development. What the concept? Explain the concept. Well, uh, open space was 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 exactly that to keep open space, so that we wouldn't end up with bricks and mortars over. Uh, the entire area. Because every time somebody bought a parcel of, or a, a bought a house, a parcel of land, they paid a transfer tax, and then that transfer tax was supposed to mitigate that impact by having open space someplace else preserved, right? Absolutely. When you uh, when you have that fund, it needs to be used for the purpose intended. Mm -hmm. And let me repeat: the purpose of that was to buy open space keep pace with all of the other rooftops that were showing up, you know, taking away the natural uh, receptacle for our, our drainage problems and all. And to, uh, to diminish that program, I thought, was, uh, was unmistakably wrong. And I, I let every governor know that I worked around, that it was not the right thing to do. And finally, uh, sponsored legislation to raise the cap because they had a cap on it and to raise the cap and uh, uh, Governor William Donald Schaefer was in office at the time and rest his soul, uh, uh, he and I had a very long conversation in his office about it. He said, well, where am I going to get the money if I, if I raise the cap and that money goes back? He said, where am I going to get the money? I said, uh, I'm not sure where you're going to get it, but where you're getting it from is the wrong place. Uh, when, a legis when legislation is passed and the public perception is you're going to use this money for X, Y, and Z, that ought to occur. To do less than that, I think, is uh, somewhat hypocritical. And uh, I never changed my mind on that. We were successful in getting that cap raised and getting the uh, open space program moving back uh, the way it was originally intended. What about blue crabs? Whenever I think about Bernie's boats, I always think about uh, a business that thrived from people who wanted to come out for the day, they wanted to go fishing, they wanted to go crabbing, and they knew if they rented one of your little boats, they could go out and fill their bushel baskets. So you've seen a lot of changes with blue crabs, good and bad, and you were involved in lots of work on the commission related to blue crabs. Tell us about that. After returning from uh, World War II, uh, I had uh, dreams and visions of opening up a uh, rental boat rental business at Brooms Island. I had worked in one, the first one was ever in that part of the country. I'd worked uh, during my high school years, and I decided that this would be a good way, a very good way to, uh, to enjoy life and make a living at the same time. And I did just that. I was able to get started on it. And uh, in those days, uh, this is back in the 50s, the uh, blue crabs were so abundant, so abundant in the Patuxent River, that when the by boats, by boats would come in from the eastern shore because they had a lot of crab picking houses over there, they'd come in and buy the crabs out of the Patuxent River. They were nice fat crabs, you know, the water was good and healthy then and uh, take them back to Eastern Shore and fix them up for steamed crabs, crab cakes, and what have you. They were so plentiful, they actually put a limit on the number of crabs you could catch in a day. We didn't have crab pots then. I'm talking about a trot line where you dip them one by one. The limit, the limit on the number of crabs that you could catch in the early 1950s and the Patuxent River was 15 
barrels, sugar barrels of crabs. That's a lot of crabs. Use your hands. How big is a bush? How is a big as a, that's, a sugar I think barrel? It's, I think it's about three and a half bushel. I think. It, it was that's way. It was just so abundant. That's the way it was. That was our way of life, and uh, uh, we saw. Not too long after that, when the river began to fail and the bay began to fail, we began to see a real reduction. And today, uh, we sold many, many. That? When did you start perceiving the reduction? We started seeing it in about 1969, about the time when the grasses started disappearing. Uh, everything began to slow down a little bit. The water got cloudy. The transparency of the water was getting very poor. We had a lady at Broom's Island, Dixie Buck, that she was a champion soft shell crabber, and she caught 25 dozen soft shell crabs in one day. This is in the 50s, and she sold them at that time for 12 cents a dozen, one penny apiece for soft shell crabs. And uh, I remember one time she made a remark to me because she knew that I was upset. We were trying to stir up some. Uh, excitement over the demise of the river. We wanted people to understand that there was something dramatic happening out there, and we really had to uh, we really had to take stock of what we were doing and put the brakes on. And she told me, she says, "You know, you're right, Bernie." She said, "The water is really getting cloudy. I can't see the bottom hardly anymore. Can't see it at all in Nan's Cove, which was full of crabs. They crab by the Mud Street just to." Movement of the crab would stir up the sediment, and they'd dip in front of the sediment, and that's how they'd catch the crabs. But the uh, the blue crab uh, industry was uh, uh, blessed by having the Chesapeake Bay Commission to establish a uh, blue crab committee, and uh, there was two chairmen of that committee, uh, uh, Delegate Bloxham and uh, Delegate John Wood, that headed that committee up. Uh, they did a uh, they did a fantastic job on that. It was very successful, and it ultimately led, after years and years of, of nurturing and controlling, it led to uh, legislation that really, uh, or regulation, I should say, that led to the reduction and taking of the uh, female crabs we commonly call sook, because. Uh, like I told the governor one time, if you don't have mamas out there, you aren't going to have any babies. It's just that simple. And that was, uh, that was the right thing to do. Uh, this particular year that we're in now, uh, 2014, has not been a uh, bonanza for the crabbers, and we're uncertain just what's causing it. But we saw a real rebound in the crabbing industry once they uh, began to uh, prohibit taken of uh, a lot of the female crabs. Talk to me about the phosphate detergent ban and what was going on back then in just the environmental community and the business community and others just coming together on that issue. Well, the phosphate ban, I believe, went on for several years and he got defeated because the uh, uh, the, the, the phosphate ban was absolutely essential. It was a big part of reducing the phosphorus going into the into the waters of the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. But the lobbyists were so determined to defeat that bill because they saw this taking money away from them. They even used excuses like, uh, you know, your shirts will never be white again. If you take the phosphate out of the detergent, you won't have any more white shirts. It's just impossible to clean a, a shirt, get it nice and white without the phosphate in it. Well, it all turned to be, uh, pardon me, hogwash. That wasn't the case. That was just an excuse to keep a little more money in their coffers. And after, uh, after several years, the lead sponsor of that bill was Senator Gerald Weingrad. And... Uh, I was a co-sponsor of the bill with him, one of the many sponsors of the bill with him, and we fought hard for it, and we finally got it through. We got it passed, and uh, we know the benefits there. It's, uh, it's, it's untold, and uh, we found out, uh, I found out in... 41% of the phosphorus reduction 
is attributed to the phosphate detergent bans. Yeah, you, you know, the, the question is, well, well, what good did the phosphate ban did? I'll tell you what it did. It reduced the phosphate going in, the phosphorus going into the uh, headwaters of the bay and its tributaries by 41%. That's a pretty dynamic figure. And, uh, you know, if you think back, the successes that we've had thus far on the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries has not been through the voluntary process, although uh, collaborative volunteerism is a great thing, but it won't work on the Bay. The successes we've enjoyed has been through mandatory legislation and court suits. That has been the driving force that has uh, recorded the successes that we've no have taken place on the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. But of course, one of the things is, talk to us about, as a legislator, if you do want to legislate, you need to know that the people are behind you. So the people need to be helping you do that heavy lift. Isn't that right? Yeah, you know, that any, uh, any legislation that that you introduce in Annapolis, before you put it in the hopper, you want to talk with people. You want to talk with organizations. You want to make sure the Chesapeake Bay Commission is in agreement with you. You want to make sure the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is on board and they're in favor. If you want the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, you want to save our stream. We're all together in this working for the common cause of cleaning up the most precious environmental resource, in my judgment, in the whole world. If that Chesapeake Bay was cleansed once again like it was back as a child when I knew it, we could feed the world. We now import billions of dollars in seafood into the, into the watershed. That's so unnecessary if we could bring that wonderful resource back where it was. We could actually feed the world. And, uh, Let's continue to uh, let's continue to be strong about it. And don't be discouraged. You'll be disappointed time and time again. I have, but I never let myself be discouraged. I continue to realize that there's a real prize at the end, and the fight is not a worthless one. You're fighting for a real cause. Uh, aside from the gracious and delicious food that you get out of the Chesapeake Bay. There's a serious matter of human health involved in this. So all in all, we, uh, we need to uh, pull the stops out and continue to, to continue to fight and continue to have that stick to itiveness and that tenacity, not to give up, but to keep on. As Winston Churchill once said in a speech he made, eight words, never give up, never, never, never give up, nor should we ever. Bernie, how important has it been for you to know people in the neighboring states that are affecting Chesapeake Bay? You know, you now know lots of people in Virginia, lots of people in Pennsylvania. How important has that been to you? One of the, uh, speaking, speaking about the Chesapeake Bay Commission, one of the great assets that uh, is is available to all of us is the fact that you uh, you get to know each other and, and after a while you begin to bond it becomes like a a family it isn't just people you're dealing with these are people that that have a uh, a perspective in the mind and they've got an objective in the heart and uh, it's easy to work with but it's been so helpful to have this this uh, lot of numbers now because it the, the uh, commission changes membership ever so often. When the uh, political leadership changes in the state, sometimes they make new appointments. And that's the system. We accept that. But we find that in short time, once they're on that commission, they are, uh, once acclimated, they begin to realize the treasure that we have there and the absolute uh, essential necessity and uh, doing all we can, doing all we can within economic reasonability to, uh, to make the change. But the, the friendship that you build with these people, I still talk with people that 
had been off the commission for 10 years. Uh, I still consider them as dear friends. That friendship would have not occurred, nor would I have had the benefit of their, their, their knowledge and their resource and their intellect to, uh, to help us because, you know, uh, life is not a one-man show. Life is everybody trying to work together in a, for a common cause that is good and right for society as a whole. That's what we're here for. That's God's plan for us here. We've got to take care of that. Uh, John Fitch Kennedy uh, once said, uh, President Kennedy once said, that surely God's work on earth is ours, and that is so true. We have the ability to do it. We have the knowledge to do it. What we need is the courage and the tenacity and the resources. And there's a lot of complaining, a lot of complaining about the flush tax and the rain tax, and nobody likes taxes. I haven't found anyone yet really loves taxes. But we mess this thing up. And with the friends that we're talking about on the Chesapeake Bay Commission and the other organizations and friends in general that we talk with all the time, we need them to bond with us to make sure that we don't lose sight and we don't lose the purpose of why we exist. And that's surely to do God's work here on earth. This was a pretty unique situation back in John Smith's day. We'll never get it back to that, but I'm convinced that we can do a lot better than we're doing, and we should. And it's because of the friends you make with the different organizations, particularly the Chesapeake Bay Commission, that makes their job a little easier and gives you the, uh, gives you the enthusiasm to continue to move forward. Tell me about this. You've always struck me as a legislator that has very strong ties to the science community. How did that come about, and why, why, why are they important to you? I've had, uh, always had a great, uh, I, I'll call it love, a great love and respect and admiration for uh, one particular uh, scientific organization, and that's the uh, Chesapeake Biological Lab, not the only one but the one that I'm most familiar with because uh, uh, they, were, they were my counsel. They were the people. I didn't even know how to spell eutrophication until I met them, uh, much less know what it meant. And uh, it was the, it was the uh, well-trained minds and also the determination and the, the exactness that they was looking for in their science that has helped to cultivate me and to give me the, uh, the bank of knowledge that I need to stand for what I want to do. But the Chesapeake Bay uh, Laboratory at Solomons, Maryland, that's a branch of the University of Maryland, one of the best universities in the United States, incidentally, uh, have really been the godsend to educating people. Scientists are, are very bright people, and they're kind of strange because you say, well, uh, what is the problem? Well, we're looking at it. They won't tell you what the problem is until they're 99 and 99, 100% sure they are right. The science they give you is an exact science. You can take it to the bank. And that's what I've done all of my life, all, of my, all the time that I've spent working with the different organization. I listen carefully to them, and then I take their advice and run with it. And uh, it has never failed me yet. How many years have you been a member of the Chesapeake Bay Commission? I think it's about 30 years. As I went on, I believe, in 1984, I think I was appointed to the Chesapeake Bay Commission, and uh, it's been a highlight of my, my public life. Uh, even out of office as a citizen representative, I still, uh, I still enjoy trudging off to those meetings because you always come home a lot richer in knowledge and, uh, and uh, bonding with the people on the commission than you did before that meeting. So, uh, 
So tell me about this. Rarely have I ever seen you travel to one of those meetings without your wife, Betty. And so I can't help but think uh, that the partnership there it has helped you to become a leader. Um, tell me about Betty's role in your leadership. I've often said one of the greatest decisions, in fact, I'll say the greatest decision I ever made was when I was uh, 14 years old in 1938 when I decided I was going to use the divinity as a part of my life. The second best decision I think I ever made, I know I ever made, was falling in love with a beautiful young lady down at Bernie's Boats at Brooms Island. And uh, her mother introduced me to her. They were two of my best customers. Her mother and father were two of my best customers. And they brought this beautiful young lady with them one day. And I could look at her and tell her she wasn't a fisherman. Uh, but she was beautiful and she there was a good chemistry. And I think it was sort of love at first sight. And uh, we have recently celebrated our 65th wedding anniversary, September the 9th, uh, which I think is commendable. It's been a beautiful journey. There's been some rocky spots in that journey because of the economy and what have. But the one thing that I have had that has been my, uh, my best friend, she's my best friend, but she was always there to console me. When I felt down, she was always there to build me up. When you get these disappointments for something you're working hard and you fail a piece of legislation or something goes amok or wrong that, that you knew was right and it upsets you, she was always there to kind of nurture me along and to share with that tender loving care she had for me. And uh, she's been a wonderful wife, she's been a wonderful mother, and she's been a, a helpmate that's unmatchable, I think, in this world. And the way she looked out for me when I was in public office, when she had to stay with the kids and I'm off, you know, doing my thing that I was convicted to do. And uh, I just want to take this moment to, to thank her and to thank our Heavenly Father that uh, this match uh, was made, and I truly believe it was made in heaven. It's been wonderful. So going back to another less emotional question, um, I have a recall of you working on a very, very important piece of legislation that had to do with the sewage treatment plants, the large sewage treatment plants. Can you tell us about that? Because at the time, I remember thinking he knows to do this because of his experience on the Patuxent. But that was a sweeping piece of legislation. Can you remind me about that? I recall the, the decision that we made, the, the Tri-County made back in the early 70s, and it was a unanimous decision. Every county commission and every legislator from that uh, geographic part of the state, good old Southern Maryland, voted to hire an environmental attorney and to go to court and to fight this thing in court. And we, uh, we did just that. So after the, the, the court's decision, uh, the federal court in the District of Columbia, the judge's decision, I was sitting in the court the day he rendered the decision, was simply the plan that the state of Maryland has turned in to clean up the Patuxent River is more of a plan for growth it does not address the amenities that need to be addressed. Therefore, I am going to order you to come up with a plan to clean the Patuxent River up and uh, also to let you know that we're going to withhold all federal funds for domestic water supply and wastewater treatment plants until you have that plan in place. That plan was a good plan. It called for the retrofit of 10 major water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plants. We have 
greater than 35, but they're much smaller plants. Some of them aren't but a couple of hundred thousand gallon a day. So after the, the, the court's decision, uh, the federal court in the District of Columbia, the judge's decision, I was sitting in the court the day he rendered the decision, was simply the plan that the state of Maryland has turned in to clean up the Patuxent River is more of a plan for growth. It does not address the amenities that need to be addressed. Therefore, I am going to order you to come up with a plan to clean the Patuxent River up and uh, also to let you know that we're going to withhold all federal funds for domestic water supply and wastewater treatment plants until you have that plan in place. That plan was a good plan. It called for the retrofit of 10 major water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plants. We have greater than 35, but they're much smaller plants. Some of them aren't but a couple of hundred thousand gallon a day. And it, it's a huge amount of flow given how populated Maryland is. Yeah, at, okay. at that particular time, the, uh, the flow rate was about 30 million gallon. Today, as we speak, it's in excess of 60 million gallon a day that was coming out of the wastewater treatment plants. But in order to, to garner the kind of support that I needed for that piece of legislation, it was Senate Bill uh, 5, 5, 531, 531, I believe. And uh, what it did, uh, it mandated that the major wastewater treatment plants in the Patuxent River watershed, which was 10 of them, meet the maximum standards of 3 milligrams of liter per uh, three milligrams of nitrogen per liter of water and not greater than one milligram of phosphorus per liter of water. If they fail to do it by certain dates, those dates were in the bill, the uh, fine would kick in on them. They had to pay by the poundage. The amount of fine was in the bill. And uh, it was a tough bill. It was kind of a mean bill. But that bill represented exactly what the plan had called for back in 1982. But there were, it was cutting edge. There were few plants nationwide that were receiving that level of nutrient yeah. reduction. We got it through the Senate. Uh, did, uh, we did a lot of talking, and we buttonholed a lot of people. And fortunately, we had uh, the president of the Senate at that time, who was... Uh, Senator Mike Miller, uh, who was in my corner on that, and because he was also at one time served as a member of the Tri-County Council. In fact, I think he does today also. But uh, he was very helpful with that. Uh, where the snafu came in is once we got the bill through both houses, after a lot of talking and discussion and arguing, we got it through both houses, then I got word from Governor Donald Schaefer that he was not going to sign the bill because it was a mean bill. He didn't like the bill. He wasn't going to sign it. So I made an appointment and went over and I talked with the governor at that time. And he and I were uh, very good friends. I had great respect for him. He was a great governor. And he was very good to me. And I explained to him the importance of this bill. Well, why can't you do it without doing this? And I said, we've tried. We've tried now for almost a decade. It just isn't happening. And the only way we're going to get it done is to make it mandatory so they have to do it. And uh, he put his hands behind his head sort of like this, which was a habit of his. He said, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, cursed a million times for this because I've already said I wasn't going to sign the bill, but I'm going to sign the bill for you. And he signed it in with a lot of fanfare. It was a lot of people at that bill signed. And that, to me, was a very historical piece of legislation. Immediately, I mean, once they met the standards, that river began to show all kind of different life. The aquatic, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation was coming back. Uh, at a weight in, the kids were pulling the grass up, making wigs that we hadn't seen grass for years there. 
the transparency of the water got so much better and it looked like we'd turned a corner. The problem that we had was that the, the bill did all it was supposed to do, but it didn't go far enough because with the growth the way it was, uh, our volume of, uh, of affluent going into the river at that time almost tripled in a short period of time. So while we made great strides and the river was coming back, the magnitude of the growth soon backed that up and uh, had a been, had a had division to to treat that legislation a little differently to where they could not exceed certain volumes i think we would would have had a clean river today but uh it made a big difference and the wastewater treatment plants today are not doing all they can do but they're doing a much better job and it's a it's a real sense of comfort to know like Blue Plains, which is uh, hundreds of millions of gallons a day, and they're cleaning that up. And they're making big strides to clean up the stormwater in Washington, D.C. Huge amounts of money, billions of dollars being spent to do that. And the things like that, that while uh, our disappointments will always come, it continues to give us hope because we see changes happening that give us cause for uh, enthusiasm. So, uh, through the grace of God, your grandchildren and my children hopefully will outlive you. And if they do, what advice would you give them as the next generation of leaders? What should they do for Chesapeake Bay? I believe one thing that we that we have to do, and that's to uh, that's to improve the environmental education that we have in the school systems, not just in Maryland but in the entire Bay watershed. And I say that selfishly because we're focused on that sixty-four thousand square miles of jewel right now, and uh, that's our number one. But we really need to, we need to improve that because our children have got to receive the education that we failed to get when we were in school. We learned everything we've learned through the hard knocks by watching the rivers die, by watching the crabs uh, diminish, by watching the fish get uh, lesions on them, by watching all kind of things happen that's not good for the bay. And uh, we've got to do all we can to make sure that our children avoid the experiences that we've had. I want them to have the joy that I had when I was a child growing up. What a magnificent time of my life. And uh, it is not impossible, it's not an impossibility. It's like pushing a medicine ball up uh, Mount Everest sometime, but uh, that doesn't stop you. You just fight a little harder for it. These young people, these young people deserve, deserve better, and they're going to be the stewards that are going to have to make it better. We are not going to live long enough. None of us in this room, I think, are going to live long enough to see a cleansed Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. I think we could do it by taking one river and concentrating on that, and that, of course, the, the, the best uh, laboratory would be the Patuxent River, of course, but uh, I, I just don't think there's any way that we're going to see the changes come about fast enough to cleanse that river that will uh, will make our children happy immediately, but it's their future, and our young people have got to, they have got to step up, they've got to take the reins, but they've got to have the educational tools to do that. We've got to dramatize so they know that this is, this is not a, a fun thing, that this is serious business. Not only is it going to eradicate the wholesome seafood we had, but it's also going to be a very detrimental uh, situation for human health as we now understand it. So do you think that you can have economic vitality in this region without environmental health? 
because you've seen a lot, you've seen it when it's been really environmentally vibrant. You've also seen the Bay Region in some of its strongest periods of growth. Um, you know, you've done some development work yourself. Um, what, what, it, how do you find the balance? What is the balance? I guess one of the biggest problems we have, and uh, this isn't a secret, isn't classified, I think we all know it, is growth. And this is the United States of America. It's, uh, it's very difficult to stop growth. Uh, even if people wanted to do it, it would be hard to stop. But growth is the reason the problem exists, because the way we interact and the the uh, elements that we need to sustain life, our wastewater treatment plants and uh, fertilization of our lawns and all the other things, stormwater runoff, is all caused, frankly, by people. And we're growing probably a quarter of a million people a year, aren't we not in the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed? And uh, can, we have, can we have that kind of growth and still maintain an environment that would be conducive to the aquatic life and also to the human life that exists around it? My answer is yes, I think we can, but it would not be an easy thing to accomplish because people just, we all have selfish instincts and when you have to put out the money that you need to retrofit what we've got now. Stormwater alone, which is 50% of the problem, that's including agricultural runoff, is going to cost billions and billions and billions of dollars. And uh, are we willing, are we willing to, to relinquish that kind of money in order to sustain the, the health of the Chesapeake Bay and improve it? Uh, the answer is that. It's growth. Growth is a culprit. We've got to find a way to do that. I'm not suggesting stopping it. But if you're going to grow, then wastewater treatment plants are going to have to do a better job. Either that or we're going to have to become much more innovative and find some way to accommodate human waste except by constantly dumping it into our streams, our rivers, our mm -hmm. creeks, and our bay. And uh, it isn't just that. It's the runoff we spoke of earlier. It's air deposition that's coming from places as far away as Ohio. And uh, uh, climate change. There are things right now that are taking place. In regards of how much money we have, we're going to have probably a two-foot sea level rise within this century we're living in right now, this 21st century. Even if we're able to to get international agreement to do everything we need to do today, certain things cannot be stopped. They're going to happen. It's a tough job. It's a tough job. And to, to say, uh, yes, it can be done, uh, let's qualify that yes by saying yes, but it's going to be very, very, very difficult to do. It's only until we get the hearts and minds of people less greedy and more determined to provide clean air and clean water are we going to see a return to the kind of uh, healthy environment that we had in my younger days. And I want to see that so badly for the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and many generations that will follow us. I would love to see that happen. Tell me about the time that you brought the, the goose home. And that you, there was an injured bird of some kind. Oh, yeah. And you became beholden to it. I recall one time, and this is a little bit of levity, which is necessary to keep the sanity. Uh, I recall one time there was a pair of geese that uh, lived at Dares Beach. Uh, one was named Romeo, and the other one was named Juliet. And. Uh, we don't know why, but we think some mean trick was played on one of them, and it was injured. And I used to go down to the bay every morning before I leave to go to work, 
I'd go down the bay, which was only, you know, 100 yards walk from my house, and I'd sit on the bulkhead down there, and uh, I'd always take a little corn with me, and these two geese would come swimming over, and they'd get up on it. They were, they were pretty mean-natured, and you had to get to know them, and you had to kind of cultivate them a little bit and spoil them a little bit, and then they loved you for it. They'd follow me home. But uh, we were able, with that, with that wounded goose, to uh, nurture it back to health, just tender, loving care. And uh, it's little things like that that you, you never forget. You never forget. Uh, not really a funny story as such, but one that it, it takes your mind off the, uh, the seriousness of the problem that, we, uh, that we're confronting. And what about at Bernie's boats? Did there was there ever something that was just really funny? Somebody who came and tried to rent a boat, or some thing that really just makes you laugh when you think back on it. Oh yeah, we uh, we had we had things that happened uh, when I had the boat rental place at Brooms Island that uh, it, it was kind of amusing. Uh, I recall one time when uh, I had been trying to get him to install a gas pump down there so that my customers could get gas when they came down if they, if they ran out of gas. And uh, it's in a, it was in a floodplain area, and they put the tank underground, and uh, we had a hurricane a little later on that year. I believe it was hazel. And they rising water, uh, the tank was so buoyant it popped right out of the ground with the tank and the gasoline. When the petroleum company was supplying it came over, it was all laid over on the side. Uh, that, that's not really a funny story, but it was kind of amusing to me at the time. Yeah, it seems like a disaster, actually. Yeah. <laughs> huh. All right. One of the things we used to do on the Patuxent River that was always enjoyable, when you had a full moon, we would uh, get in my cousin's boat, it was real fast, and we'd uh, ride the moon streak. We weren't going there, we'd just ride the moon streak. You'd get the bow of the boat hidden in that moon streak, and you're wide open because you could see very clear uh, any obstacles in front of you. And that was something we always enjoyed, was riding the moon streak whenever you get a good full moon. And what about phosphorescence? When you were younger, did you see that a lot? You know, the phosphorescence when the water is... Oh, blown? yeah. Yeah, off the camera. What, what happened to that? It's still around. It is. I don't see, see it. as often. But when you do, it's magical. Oh, you when you... you you've, uh, I recall back, uh, you know, I used to row a boat a lot. I still to this day enjoy rowing a boat. And uh, at nighttime in particular, when you would row that boat, when you'd turn the paddle, the oars, you could see this light, light up at both oars. And it was, it was really intriguing to see that. Uh, I haven't seen much of that lately. Maybe it's because I don't row as much, or maybe something's happened that has caused the... Uh, it's only a few days in the summer when you do see it. Yeah. And only once in my life did I see it. I saw it shore to shore on the Chester River. Shore to shore, and it was amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, what else do we need to know about, Michael? You mentioned all these uh, issues that you got involved in with the Chesapeake Bay Commission in terms of various legislative battles and victories. I'm sort of curious, what are the major defeats when you look back on the, the, the political part of the environmental movement? Uh, you know, when, you, when you're working as a legislator, whoever you are, there are times when you have... Uh, gross disappointments. You have to get accustomed to that. You can't win them all. And uh, there have been times uh, working with the Chesapeake Bay Commission that uh, 
I didn't walk away. This particular year, I didn't walk away totally happy with the the plan. They just upgraded the plan, and if you look at it, it it has some very positive things in there. Some real positive targets can make a big difference. But there's a uh, one part of the plan, and uh, you're talking about the Bay Agreement and the Bay Program Bay Agreement. That's yeah, what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, really really talking about the uh, Chesapeake Bay Agreement and the program that they put together that's in place now that's been signed off by the signatories, all of the members of the executive committee. Uh, but there was one part of the plan that uh, we fought pretty hard on. In fact, uh, we wrote a letter and tried to enumerate some of the things that we disagreed with. Some of them were changed. The one that I had hoped would be changed, that it wouldn't be an optional thing for the signatories. And as I understand the plan now, they, uh, if there's, uh, uh, let's use uh, TMDL just at random, for instance. If uh, New York State decides that they don't want to be in it, uh, it's my understanding of the plan that they can opt out of that. And my contention is, unless you have unanimity of, of agreement and uh, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, all together, you know, we'll win it together, we'll lose it together, uh, progress is going to come a lot slower than we had anticipated. And uh, I really think we ought to reexamine that I think we ought to have each one of the members of the commission that are part of that re-examining their, their binds and the signatures that have signed off on this. I think they ought, to, uh, they ought to think again. It's never too late to change your mind. Wise men do on occasions, and sometimes it's been very beneficial to do that. Uh, that's... Uh, that's my disappointment this year. Oh, there have been others. Uh, uh, not easy to recall right now, but uh, there have been other times when I haven't been totally satisfied. We've won some big victories. We mentioned earlier about the spoils going into deep channel. We won that, and uh, that would have not been won had it not been for the uh, for the tenacity, the courage, and the... Uh, uh, just determination, sheer determination of members of that commission to stand tall and fight. A lot of them were fighting against it, but there was enough of us that fought for it. The Corps of Engineers finally came out with uh, some facts that agreed pretty generally with what we had been saying for years. So talk to Michael about, in terms of wins or losses, so the Chesapeake Bay Commission made a decision to um, focus in on congressional spending and how we could improve congressional support given the fact that we signed these Bay Agreements in 2000. We knew it was going to be a lot of money. And so we began looking at federal opportunity and one of them was the Farm Bill. And we saw that there were like 84,000 farms in the watershed. And what could we do to increase that support? And ultimately, I guess what, we worked six years to try to get a special Chesapeake Bay provision in the Farm Bill. Talk to Michael about that role, the role of getting, making a decision that farmers were worth investing in and then trying to get the money. You know, we've... Uh We've listened to a lot of criticism about the agricultural community, and in some instances, it's it's not undeserved. Uh, we know pockets of problems that have not been straightened out, and uh, changes should uh, should culminate sooner than it's going to. I'm afraid, but the uh, agricultural community is such an integral part of what's good for this country. The, the food they raise and the fiber they raise that to sustain their way of life. And uh, there was a time, had it not been for the 
Chesapeake Bay Commission, uh, I question whether the Farm Bill and all the goodness that it brings forth for the farm community would have been able to survive the storm. There wasn't that much sympathy on Capitol Hill for it. But again, the uh, Chesapeake Bay Commission and uh, their uh, endless effort to make the right connections and convince the right people that uh, this was not a show-and-tell game. This was a serious matter, and money had to be appropriated to help assist, and, and assisting the farmers would mean an abatement of some of the problems that, that we have. And uh, that's a real credit to the Chesapeake Bay Commission and a real credit to Congress that after six long years, they finally saw the light and was able to understand, not on their own volition, but because they had professionals nurturing them, lobbying them, talking to them, and convincing them that this was uh, the United States of America and America needed that particular legislation. Needed the environmental provisions of it. Yeah. Now I'm sort of curious. This a number of years ago, you participated in this event up at Washington College, where they brought together. Oh right. Um, Harry Hughes. And oh yeah, Taylor yeah, Murphy. dear. The old sages. Right. <laughs> That's when you were young. <laughs> yeah, I was younger. Yeah, my goodness. Oh. But one of the key discussions at that, that meeting had to do with getting the Chesapeake Bay program going, getting the original agreements. And the argument was made at the time that it would, unless it were voluntary, it would never have gotten going. And, and you, you've, some of the things you've said today makes you wonder, okay, does the voluntary approach work? We've seen now with PMDLs and the federal government exercising you know, more direction to be moving a little bit away from the, relying upon the voluntary participation of all these different states and their state agencies. So is that a major turning point? Is that, what's, what's your take on that? Well, I, I could say this, that from the bottom of a grateful heart, I, uh, I have great respect for all those who volunteer. There, there, there are many people, hundreds and thousands of people that volunteer to to do what they can to plant trees, to uh, plant uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, to uh, take the old junk that people carelessly and ruthlessly throw into the rivers and the bays and all. And uh, uh, I am not underestimating at all the goodness that the volunteers do. But the bottom line of, you know, being able to accommodate the big picture. I just don't think that the volunteer system, uh, it can play a role, but it can never accomplish it on its own. It has got to have, it has got to have the teeth, it's got to have the uh, mandatory uh, element, whether it be the legislature, whether it be through the courts, or what it be. But EPA has taken the role they should have taken when the law was passed, the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. Uh, EPA was uh, on recess for the most part for a long, long time. I have dear friends in the EPA. I've worked with them over the years. And uh, I know some of we've had uh, one of the administrators, uh, Carol Browner, who came to the weigh-in and declared Bernie Fowler Day from the EPA standpoint. And uh, I was very honored to have her, and she was a very, uh, very productive lady and very sincere in what she was doing. The, the problem that I have with EPA is about the time you get someone acclimated and they understand the problem fully, uh, they, they're off to 10 buck two somewhere and you get somebody new on. And uh, I think right now, though, we have somebody that is not new to the situation at all. And I think it can be a blessing in disguise because uh, he doesn't have to learn. He knows. He knows when he was a Marylander. He knows when he was uh, 
secretary of one of our regulatory agencies. Uh, Bob purchased Hepatitis Direct. Absolutely. Deputy. Absolutely. And Bob can be a big, Bob Perceptive can be a great help at a time when we sorely need him. Sure, they all are. Yeah. All of my young doctors retired. They so were young. One of the things that I think Michael was getting at, and you might want to talk about, is participation in the Chesapeake Bay program and the Bay Agreements, and participation in the Chesapeake Bay Commission is voluntary. But then, as members of those organizations, either as a signatory to the Bay Agreement or as a member of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, then you go back to your own jurisdiction and implement. And that's where the mandates come in. So there's kind of a voluntary component where you all come together and learn and promise. And then you go back into your own jurisdictions and work it. And that's where you make a choice where some things are voluntary, some things are mandatory. I don't know. Yeah, it's that's you're complex. Getting it. You're getting it. But yeah. so you see, when you're signing the agreement, for example, earlier, what I think you were trying to get at is this latest agreement, everyone signed on the dotted line. And that meant you were all in it together. That's what that always meant. We're in it together. We'll go back to our own jurisdictions and do what we can. This time around, even if you signed on the dotted line, you still had an option where you didn't have to try. And I think what, somehow what you were saying is, at that voluntary level, everyone has to at least be willing to try. And later on, you go into your own jurisdictions and decide what you're gonna mandate. And for you, some of the things that you've decided to work to mandate have been your biggest gains. So I don't know how to say that succinctly, but. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the the Chesapeake Bay Commission is is voluntary. We all know that, but when you are voluntary and you don't have the power to implement, uh, it doesn't make it negative because you do have the influence of talking with folks back home in your local jurisdictions, which can help to make it happen, and with. EPA using a strong leverage now and giving them deadlines and all, they have to come up with plans to meet certain stands at certain time. It, uh, it, it, it makes it a different picture altogether. But my point in saying what I said earlier about the, uh, the op and in and op and out, while we are a voluntary organization, that voluntary organization ought to be in concert in unanimity it shouldn't be splintered off and given the option of saying, well, we're not going to do it in New York or we're not going to do it in West Virginia, we're not going to do it in Delaware. Uh, and uh, because that then takes away the, the only uh, real control you have to work with the local people to where it's going to happen, to work with them to bring about uh, uh, the vital change that all of us know is absolutely necessary. But... Uh, Many of us are not willing to, uh, not many of us are willing to, to really put the shoulder to the wheel and uh, do the things we ought to do. But it makes you wonder, I mean, if EPA had taken an aggressive position right from the start based on the Clean Water Act, could they, have, could they in essence, have short-circuited or made irrelevant the need to, to, to have the states get together for, for a Chesapeake Bay program? I, 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 I don't think that it would necessarily short-circuited too much. Oh, it could have helped it tremendously. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, because... Clean water, though. I'm sorry? That's true. Remember, right. to Clean Water Act. Right. That EPA is about water, but yeah. the Bay Program is about fish and crabs true. and forests. Mm -hmm. And living resources. Yeah, so, right, right. Make that point. So, we'll go back right to your question back again. Your question again. <laughs> well, I was just reacting to what you were saying about the EPA taking, having a lot of leverage, and it made me wonder if if EPA, okay, maybe EPA, Fish and Wildlife, if the federal agencies had gotten together okay, that's different. years ago and said, we gotta, you have to do these things, you have to meet these 
water quality levels and and these fish protection actions would that have made unnecessary the Chesapeake Bay agreements where the states get together and say well we voluntarily agree we will try to do this mm -hmm. maybe I'm asking a, 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 yeah. it's a counterfactual we can look at history but it makes you but but you've mentioned it's lawsuits that have that made some of the major drivers and those lawsuits go back to federal law I really, you know, looking back over the space of time and the history of the activities that have happened, I really believe that much of the problem we have today could have been short-circuited or maybe even avoided completely. If the regulatory agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agent, had a really stepped to the plate and done the job, they didn't do it because I am unconvinced today, as I was years ago, I don't think there was enough conviction. I don't think they grasped the severity or the gravity of the problem, and therefore they were inactive about it until the, you know, the hammer comes down and hard uh, and wakes them up, realize that. Uh, I can give you a comparison back, and I won't mention the governor's name, but the first governor that I talked with, you probably figured out who it was, uh, patted me on the shoulder and told me, he said, there's nothing wrong with the Chesapeake Bay, there's nothing wrong with the Patuxent River. Bernie, you're going to drive tourists away from, they won't want to come to the, to the bay to go fishing and all. It's wrong, you shouldn't do that. He's quoted in the newspaper saying that. I think I still have a copy of the print. And... Uh, uh, that's what I'm saying about the lack of on hands-on knowledge and experience. When you watch the grass die and you watch the water get cloudy and you watch the muck and you see the silt where it used to be nice sandy beaches and no more the nice green aquatic uh, vegetation, we always call it seal or seaweed, uh, then you... You, you know something's wrong. It isn't cyclistic. And I think they, they fail really to do the job, quite frankly. That's a harsh statement. The other thing, though, as I would imagine, because of your work with the Patuxent at the local level, the county commissioners, with the state general assembly, and with the federal level, is you begin to realize that nobody alone has the power and that there's power at different levels. So the challenge becomes now that we have all these people, how do we get all those decision points in synchrony? You know, because even if the federal government had exerted their strength, they don't control decisions in Calder County, yeah. you know? So talk about that. Talk about all these different layers. And just what, what you would do differently or your observations. Because you've now been a leader at multiple levels. You ought to run for Congress. You might win. <laughs> <laughs> I voted for you for <laughs> lieutenant governor. Did you really? Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> That's one more vote I know I got. <laughs> we could have made a difference. That team would have made a difference. Yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. I was, I was all... I would have brought, I'd have brought bright minds in to taking care of all of the... Who are you running with? Uh, Joe Matoshevsky. Right. Okay. He was a good man, too. Yeah. And he made a public commitment that... that like in late 80s? When was that? That was, uh, well, I retired in, that was uh, in 80, no, wait a minute. I retired in 94, so it was 94. It was 94. Right, I forgot about that. We were at the bottom of the pack when we started because we was the last ones to get started. But... Uh, uh, the uh, the happy part about it was we finished up in second place, <laughs> and my county carried us solid. That's the great. only county that we carried in Maryland was Calvert County, which I I thought was very flattery. I really yes, did. Yeah. Well, because they're the ones that know you best. Yeah, yeah, right. I think so. You're voted yeah. down by your local people. See, my plan has always been, uh, in everything that I've done, like the uh, Calvary Alliance, again, we're digressing here, but 
the Capital Alliance Against Substance Abuse. I was chairing a delegation in Annapolis, and uh, we had the secretary had put on the agenda for the next meeting that the sheriff's department and the state police from the three southern Maryland counties would like to come and meet the delegation. Absolutely. So she put them on the agenda, and they came up. And they began to talk. You have to remember, I was naive. I, I never knew what it was, drugs. I, I never knew what, you know, drugs was. You know, maybe aspirin tablet and you had a headache or something. Never knew what it was. And so uh, I was sitting there very nonchalant and naive, and this one state policeman spoke up and said, we busted a crack house in Dares Beach last week. My ears shot up, and I, you know, what's going on here? You know, I, am I living in a different world? Why didn't I know this? And it was happening right under my nose, and I didn't know it. So what I did then was to do what I've always done. Who's in charge? Go to the governor. Go to the governor. And let him know there's a serious problem in Southern Maryland, a serious problem in the state. You're no different than, than we are in Southern Maryland. And Governor Schaefer, we need to do something. We need to get something going down. And I don't know what it is. Well, do you have any ideas what you want to do? I said, well, we really need to coordinate the educators, public officials, judiciary, bring everybody together that has any stake in this at all. And uh, I'll tell you, that afternoon the office was full of people, set that thing up, and it worked good. But... Once we got it going, I chaired it just long enough to pick people that I knew would carry the ball. Harold Cale, who was president of uh, Crawford Bank at the time, it's PNC now, very dear friend, very bright, very organized mind. And I went to him and told him, I said, Harold, I don't have time to do this any longer. The need is there, but it needs someone like you that's well organized. I've got my fingers in a dozen different things, and I've just, I, I just don't want to embarrass myself. Will you take a chairmanship of that and get it going and get it on the road? And he did a whale of a job, and it's probably one of the most powerful groups in the state right now in terms of deterring. Now, they're not cured it. Don't get me wrong. It's still going on and bad. But uh, what I do, if I'd have been elected governor of the state, I mean, the lieutenant governor of the state of Maryland, he already told me, you're taking... You're taking natural resources, you're taking Department of Agriculture, the Department, Department of the Environment, then they're going to report to me. Of course, I guess under the law they have to report to him, but they're going to report to you. They're going to work for you and not me. That's, that's a promise I make. And I would have brought people in. I would have brought brainy people in that understood all of the details to have run it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have traded I wouldn't have traded what was right to make some Eastern Shore man richer than he was. I wouldn't make that trade off. That wouldn't have happened. And uh, I guess that's one reason we didn't make it. Was, uh, Pat Sajak had a big party for us up his house in Baltimore County. Nice guy. And uh, at the very end, after we both made our speeches, very end, he come up and put his arm around us. I've got pictures of all of this that they took put his arm around it. He said, you know one thing? I hate to say this. I really hate to say this. These guys are not going to get elected. You know why? They're too damn honest. People don't elect honest politicians. That's why we're in it. He said it right out. We're in now. Because we had people like this, things would be different in the state of Maryland. But we're not going to get it. I wish them the best, and I'm going to give them a heavy donation. I can tell you that I'm here today to support them, and I want all of you to support them. So if frequently you f functioned as almost the moral compass for others, is that tiring or inspiring? Inspiring. Inspiring because when I go to bed at night, sometimes I reflect on what happened yeah. during the day, and it makes me feel good to know that I didn't do anything to hurt anybody, that I didn't do anything derogative or anything uh, immoral that would uh, uh, make my family ashamed of me. I've got a wonderful family. Just don't come any better. Yeah. Uh,
preachers, they, they need the, uh, uh, got a musical director. I've got one now that's gonna, gonna turn out to be a jewel. She, she's uh, the latest graduate that we had. Both of them are gonna do real good, they're both girls. How many kids and how many grandkids? Four children and eight grandkids and seven great-grandchildren. My youngest great-grandchild uh, was one year old, April the 13th of this year. And who will be able to, to revive these younger minds, give them the incentive, give them the conviction, give them the desire, give them that determination to move forward, to try and rescue this 64,000 miles of gym that we have. People like you. People and, who care. Yeah, it's, it's, and there will it, always be people who care. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's my hope, my prayer, my desire that there will be people that will will remember some of some of the things we've said, some of the things that you and I and others yeah. uh, have uh, have recorded for various reasons. I and that to. can serve as a base, or a, that can serve as a benchmark, or a nucleus for you know, for the renewal, the renaissance of the enthusiasm and desire to do it. But we have got to, we've got to get word of, we have got to get rid of one word, five letter word, and that word is greed. That has got to be stimulated downward. You can't continue to go on and look at that almighty dollar as the only thing that, you know, that's important to you, you know. And I don't, it's not wrong to be rich. I, I love to see people get rich. I wish I was rich myself, but I'm not going to get rich. I'm not going to get rich at the risk of taking the bread and the, the air and everything else out of my uh, children's mouths and, and the grandchildren and the generations that will follow us shortly if the, if the world stands. I have to tell you, I recently was paddling on the eastern shore, just below the Virginia line. I paddled for about eight miles, and you could see to the bottom, and you could see the crabs running. And in front of the bow of my boat, as my boat moved, I was in a kayak, there was Spanish mackerel leaping across the bow of the boat. And it made me think about you and what you had seen. Yeah. And the reason I bring it up is that there are places in the bay. Still exist. Yes. Still which exist. Means all is not lost. Keep fighting. No. No, we 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 realize that and have great appreciation and and respect for those that have helped to maintain that. But it's a common. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Tom Miller, tells me before the end of this century, the mouth of the bay will be down in North Carolina because of the sea level yeah. rise and because the land subsided. And uh, like I said earlier in our comments, uh, that there's, there's no magic wand. There's no magic wand. And uh, even if we had one, and we waved it. There's certain ongoing activities that are going to make these things materialize, irrespective of what we do. If we got religion today and changed our habits all together, was able to get 100% cooperation, things are going to happen to this this planet that we can't do anything about. Maybe it'll survive. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I, again, I, if you have to remember, I've got, uh, I'm kind of hung up on that thing we call the Holy Bible. <laughs> it's worth the fight, though, right? It's worth the fight. Oh, absolutely. Ch Chesapeake Bay has absolutely defined your life. And you fought a lot for it. I guess the thing I, I guess maybe the last question that I have is, is, um, there you were in National Geographic. There you were the icon. You really were. You became the image of Chesapeake Bay. 
and for all the nation and all the world out, out of thousands of photographs that they took on Chesapeake Bay. And all the crabs and all the eels and all the skipjacks and all the boaters, they chose you. That's pretty, um, that's, that's, that's a, a pretty serious responsibility to be the Chesapeake Bay icon. Now, how did that make you feel? It, it doesn't trouble me. I'm not, a refra I'm not afraid. I don't have any fear of the responsibility because I know that, that what we're doing is right. I know it's right, and I know it's God's work here on earth. And uh, to compromise that would be, it would be hypocritical and sinful, and it would be, uh, it would be double-crossing yeah. my Father in Heaven, and I don't intend to do that. So it's been an honor to be a leader. I'm it's sure. been an honor, and it really has. And I, I could have been an extremely wealthy person today if I wanted to be extremely wealthy. But we're satisfied. We've got a halfway decent home. Uh, we're happy. Beth, Betty is happy here, and she's been anywhere we've ever lived. We started out our marriage in a, uh, it was an old garage, one car garage, and I made a uh, hunting cabin out to rent it out. And uh, when we got married, that's what we moved into. But then I added a little kitchen off the side of it. And then the next thing you know, I added a bathroom on it because we had an outside privy at the time. And then uh, here come the children, so I've decided to re renovate the whole thing, and we ended up, it was a fairly decent home. The exterior wasn't uh, the most beautiful by any stretch of imagination, but it was good and warm. We had three bedrooms, nice bath, nice kitchen, and we were enjoying life. And I, I sold that not because I was unhappy with it. I sold it because I saw a trend that I didn't like. Betty was taking my children off to Sunday school, and I was staying there because Sunday was the busiest day I had. And then all of a sudden, it started ringing a bell, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And I decided that, that money wasn't everything, that uh, I... I was going to be the leader of my family. That was my responsibility. God given responsibility to be the leader and do the best I could. So uh, we chose, after a very short conversation, we chose to sell it. We loved it down there, to sell it and uh, move out of the community and do something else. And uh, everything's worked out good. Uh, every little business I went in succeeded. It kept us going. and. It kept us in the cars we needed and the clothes we needed and what our kids needed and all. And uh, so there, there, are not, there are not many regrets in my life. The, the regret I have is that, uh, that uh, I'm 90 years old. I, I wish I could be as fortunate as Methuselah and have the, have the, uh, the mentality, absence, the dimension, the whole time is all, to continue to work and strive. I hope it don't take the 700 and whatever it was he lived, 700 years. But I, I, do, uh, I do think it's going to take a lot longer than I'm going to be allowed to be a part of. So here you are, 90 years old. You're sharp as a whip. You're in great shape. You'll run up the Probably. stairs. You'll remind <laughs> me of things. What's the secret? Tell me one thing. If I, what's your secret? I'm going to tell you the truth as I feel yeah, it. I would only expect the truth, Bernie. <laughs> I, could, I could tell you a lot of things that I do, but all of those things is, uh, is called a plan, and I wasn't the one that generated that plan. That, okay. that, that, that was a divine plan for my life, and I think it all culminated because of the uncompromising commitment that I made back in 1938 when I was 14 years old. You know that you have to keep your heart in good shape. Yeah. In order to keep your heart in good shape and your lungs in good shape, you have to challenge them. Okay. That doesn't mean once every six months. That means every day. Every day but Sunday. I so don't, what would you do? Run? Run. I had 
at home. I don't do it now because my legs are starting to trouble me some, and it's what did you do? not unusual. Every morning when I'd wake, except Sunday morning, my first thing after I'd go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, rinse my mouth out, would go. I have a little machine in my bedroom. It's called a shaker. You just lay down on your back. It has a mat. You lay down on your back. You put your heels in that, and it it shakes you. Shakes your legs, I mean really fast. You can make the fastest work, shake them. Then after I do that, I have certain uh, routines I do like on my back. And it's just like you're riding a bike overhead, oh, yeah, yeah. run overhead yeah. like that, because you don't have any stress on your joints at all. See, that's very easy to do. But you're warming them up for the day. You're getting them ready for the shocks. And I usually do that never less than 100 times. Never less than a hundred times. It's very easy. It, you can do it. Well, you Wait, won't even. What, how do you count? What's, you mean like just count. Yeah. yeah. As as well, one foot goes one. up. See, so one. That, right foot goes up two. Okay. <laughs> right foot goes up three. Right foot not not okay. one two three four. And now each time when the right foot goes up one oh, two. I got you. Okay. Yeah. And you do that. You can start off with fifty, and then you can go to a hundred. You've done that every day. Every day. Every day, even when I hurt, when I have pain, and I have pain. And have you done that for 50 years, for 20 years? No, I can't say I did it that long. It really started uh, when in, you were older. in about 19, i give you the exact year it really started. 19, about 1979, 1979. Really? Uh, uh, so I was taking exercise, and I've always ran. When I was a kid, the store was a mile away. Mom would say to me, go get me a stick of butter. You didn't buy a whole pound, yeah. you couldn't afford it. Yeah. A stick of butter was 10 cents. Yeah. Give you a dime. Yeah. And I'd run to the store, and I'd get that stick of butter and run all the way back home. It was just a habit. Didn't have a bike. There was no automobile. There was only six automobiles on you the island. You didn't have a bike because you didn't have the money. Didn't have the money, that's right. My first bike. You told me stories about where you had to tape the shoes together. Oh my God! Yeah, no, it's terrible stories. They had uh, uh, when the shoes wore out on the bottom, you'd take cardboard, go around one of the old stores and get cardboard, bring it home, and then take it, cut a piece as near as you could cut it to the sole, draw it, you know, and stick it inside there. And it worked good. It really worked good. It kept your foot warm, except. It was raining that day. The cardboard didn't last too long. And I remember I remember one of the most, and I'll never forget this, one of the most embarrassing times in my life. I was in school, and we were setting, uh, the table was, they had the table set U-shape. And uh, we were doing a, a, a speech, but we also had to draw uh, an image of what we were going to talk about. Well, I wanted to talk about beautification of the homestead. So then I had to draw a home, you know, that you'd find on typical form. And I was so excited over that. I'd always keep my feet down like this. But that one particular time, I, I just relaxed so much and I was like this. And I was just enjoying doing that, you know. And I figured this, this is going to get me in the A. This is good stuff. And I heard somebody sniggle, and I looked like this. And I looked over there, and they were looking at the holes in my shoes. Mm. And uh, it was just like somebody had punched me right in the gut, right in the solar plexus. They were friends, don't get me wrong, but kids can be cruel, man. Mm -hmm. Kids can be the cruelest tool there is. Boys. Oh, oh, boys. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it was just absolutely uh, embarrassing. And that stuck with me all my life. I, I grew it. But I never forgot it. Never forgot it. And I well, never I forgot the two boys that was doing most of the laughing. They're both You've dead. You've always now. been appreciative for everything you have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But that that did not in any way impede me from the kind of things I thought I should be doing in life. 